effective judicial protection as concepts of UK and EU law. Um, and this is a webinar which is hosted uh, together by Nine Bedford Row, Three Raymond Buildings and Brick Court Chambers. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, uh, so uh, please be advised of that. The genesis uh, of the idea for this event arose from the recent case of PI um, against Svistov Regional Prosecutor's Office which was decided by the Court of Justice of the European Union on the 10th of March this year. We therefore welcome Helen Malcolm QC, uh, lead counsel for PI, to talk about the case and the principles that it engages. As you all know, Helen is recognised for her expertise as a leading practitioner in transnational criminal law, particularly in corporate fraud, corruption and extradition. Among her many accomplishments, Helen was instructed in the very first European arrest warrant case in the UK and now lectures and advises on the effect of Brexit on European extradition. Helen was counsel for Augusto Pinochet in Spain's request for his extradition and she represented an alleged genocidaire in the infamous Rwandan extradition case of VV. Helen recently acted for Azerbaijan in a request for extradition of a woman who had spent £18 million in Harrods and she's also recently acted in leading cases on Polish fair trial rights and on Lithuanian prison conditions. The PI decision's timeliness and the potentially broad application of the principles that it engages is reflected in other recent developments, <clears throat> underscoring its potential relevance beyond criminal law. Most recently, up to and including today, we've seen debate concerning the proposed re-entry of the United Kingdom into the Lugano Convention on the recognition and enforcement of judgments in civil and commercial matters. These events will foreseeably materially impact upon mutual trust, mutual recognition, and rights to effective judicial protection with respect to civil judgments going forward. We therefore welcome Fergus Randolph QC of Brit Court Chambers, who will provide a civil practitioner's perspective on these issues. Fergus is at the forefront of EU and competition law litigation at the English Bar, and he regularly appears before the CJEU. He's been a member of the Bar Council Brexit Future Relations Committee and is in regular discussions or has been in regular discussions with civil, service, with civil servants on issues relating to Brexit. Fergus is a full member of the Brussels Bar and continues to be entitled to advise and represent clients on matters of EU law before the Commission and EU courts. If you do have any specific questions for Fergus, please do put them in the chat and I'll try to turn to them early as he is quite pressed for time this evening. Finally, on the 16th of March, the UK government published its integrated review of security, defence, development and foreign policy titled Global Britain in a Competitive Age, which emphasised the importance of an independent sanctions policy to UK defence and foreign policy going forward. We're therefore also fortunate to have Rachel Barnes of Three Raymond Buildings join us. Rachel acts for national and international companies and individuals in sanctions law and is a recognized market leader in that field. As an English barrister and US attorney, she's uniquely placed to advise on UK, US and uh, EU sanctions regimes. Rachel is currently advising a number of civil society organizations on the use of sanctions as a tool for human rights accountability and also on the UK's post-Brexit sanctions framework. If you do have a question, please post them in the chat Q&A and I'll try and weave them into the discussion if I'm able to do so. Otherwise, we'll have 15 minutes or so at the end for questions. So without further ado, can I welcome Helen to begin our discussion by introducing the PI case and to introduce the interplay of principles which it engages. Helen. You're on mute, Helen. Rookie error, first rookie error. Very good. OK, um, Josh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think before getting straight to PI, uh, it's necessary to have a little bit of a history lesson in relation to extradition arrangements in the last sort of 15, 20 years. Um, as uh, your listeners will all know, uh, 2002, 2002, um, the EU member states stepped away from the previous full blown bilateral and multilateral extradition arrangements. That had, arranged, uh, um, that had been in place 
up to that point, and in particular from the convention on extradition that we'd all been operating under. Um, the new model was based on mutual recognition and mutual trust, and ironically, in the light of what's happened since, of course, modelled on the English, Scottish, Ireland mutual recognition principles. Um, the whole basis was that extradition uh, decisions should be as between judicial authorities, cutting out all of the executive interventions. So there wouldn't be any political, any form of um, national decision. It should simply be the recognition by one judge in one country of uh, Europe of the decision of another judge in a trusted fellow member state. And trusted is the important word there. Mutual trust underpins mutual recognition. Uh, these decisions are based firmly on the assumption that all EU member states are signed up to and recognize and therefore enforce effective judicial protection of defense rights above all, uh, in particular those that are encapsulated in the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, however, it's worth querying whether that really exists to the extent that we all think and hope it does. Um, there are indications from time to time that lip service is paid to the European Convention on Human Rights. It's not always enforced or recognized on the ground in the same way in all member states. Anyhow, mutual trust was explicitly based, as I say, on the recognition of decisions by fellow judges. But that is the first area in which there's been an erosion since the framework decision uh, came into force. Um, the protection for a defendant is a decision is issued by a judge, a judicial authority, first of all, to issue a national arrest warrant, and then on the back of that, to issue a European arrest warrant. And Article 1 of the framework decision calls the extradition request a judicial decision. Uh, at the very least, the decision to extradite has to be reviewed by a judicial authority. As I say, that's always been regarded as an essential defense safeguard. However, as we all know, very often now, the person in fact issuing the extradition request is a public prosecutor, and there've been all sorts of cases in front of the European Court as to the independence of a public prosecutor and at what stage they uh, cease to have that veneer of the word judicial and become merely a, a party in the proceedings as opposed to an independent objective uh, decision maker. Uh, the further protection confirmed by the case of Bob Doey or Bob Dodgy, pronounced in both ways, depending on who you are, uh, it is that there is a dual level of protection, not only a national arrest warrant needed, but also, and separately, the European arrest warrant, based on the national arrest warrant, but separate from it, where a judge, again, looks at the case and decides whether it's an appropriate measure uh, of restraint to take on a person's liberty in another state. That has also been eroded in case law, whereas Bob Dodgy talks about a dual level of protection, case law now suggests that either a national arrest warrant or a European arrest warrant must have had the approval of the court. You don't need both. Uh, and then as a sort of final point, and this was relied on by the commission and indeed in the domestic court, also by um, the requesting state in our case, uh, there is dicta in one particular case before the European court that so long as the person concerned is brought before a court immediately on their return to the requesting state, that is enough to provide the judicial protection that is required. So that was the state of the law at the time of PI. Um, either a national arrest warrant or a European arrest warrant must have the approval of the court, or at least according to dicta, uh, that the person must be brought before the court immediately upon their return. So what were the facts of PI? Well, PI, in, in the case of PI, which is a request by Bulgaria, uh, the local prosecutor had issued what was called a detention order. Um, prosecutors in Bulgaria have power to issue a detention order valid domestically for a maximum of 72 hours. So in normal circumstances, a defendant can be arrested on the back of it, but must be brought before a court to have uh, their arrest either confirmed or discharged within 72 hours. However, 
it happens that if the defendant is abroad, the system in Bulgaria was that the same prosecutor, the very same prosecutor who issued the 72 hour detention order was able to issue a European arrest warrant on the back of it. Uh, in other words, it didn't go anywhere near a judge or judicial authority, um, save insofar as that prosecutor could be described as a judicial authority. And the slightly um, counterintuitive effect of that was that a defendant could be arrested in a foreign country and held for many months in custody awaiting extradition on the back of a document which domestically in Bulgaria only had power to hold him for 72 hours. And we argued before the Luxembourg court that there was a lack of sufficient uh, protection, judicial protection, a lack of any kind of defense safeguard in that process. But it was no answer at all to what a defendant from his life, in this case in the UK, on the basis of a 72 hour detention order issued without any involvement of a court and with far stronger reach and effect than would be the case uh, domestically and then only put before the judge after he was returned to Bulgaria, by which time his life was entirely disrupted. He would have lost his job, lost his family, lost his house in the UK and so on and so forth. And as to the question of uh, the dicta of putting the defendant before the court after his return, we argued that that, that particular case turned on its own facts, as indeed I, I think is, well, I would say that, wouldn't I? But I think is entirely right, I think it did. And the Advocate General, and then in due course, the full court agreed with us. Um, there were some uh, interesting interventions in the course of the hearing, including uh, as to one of the judges saying, well, the very fact that you're before this court surely means that you have judicial protection. Um, but in any event, they all decided, well, obviously they all it's unanimous decision as it has to be, um, but, but they agreed that the level of judicial protection that is required was not there. The result of that was that all requests by Bulgaria for extradition for persons wanted for trial, accusation extraditions in this country have been halted. Uh, everybody then held under a warrant from Bulgaria for the purposes of trial was discharged the same day. Uh, and of course it affects all accusation requests across the EU because um, it's a decision of the European Court, which is binding therefore on all other courts. Um, it raises a number of broader issues, as you said briefly in your introduction. Uh, first of all, I suppose, the extent and depth of mutual trust giving rise to mutual re recognition. Uh, my own experience now over many, many years of negotiations in Brussels on all sorts of things, including perhaps most notably uh, when we were trying to negotiate the framework decision on Euro bail, um, on, on cross-border bail, is that everybody believes that their own system is best and is pretty slow to recognize that other systems might have a value. Um, in addition to that, of course, there has been historically a division between the common law systems and the Roman law systems. Um, now we have the position that Ireland is the only uh, state, oh, no, that's not true, Malta must be the same, Malta and Cyprus, um, but Ireland is the principal state remaining it within the European Union that follows the common law system of law. Um, but in addition to that, uh, just more, more broadly than that, people tend to feel defensive the, of their own national system, and it's the one they know, and they tend very often to think that it's the best. Um, so at a micro level, every case lost in an extradition by a requesting state is treated as an affront to national pride. And there are, I know, some fairly stormy meetings at uh, CPS liaison level uh, very often with others from different, different member states with whom they're seeking to um, continue business relations after cases have been lost. Um, the flip side of that, however, is that as states learn from each other and as conditions improve across Europe to a reasonable common denominator, not hopefully the lowest common denominator, um, and as states are being dragged into the 21st century in terms of appropriate judicial protection, as well as better prison conditions and the like, overall, it ought to have the effect of increasing mutual trust and therefore of increasing mutual recognition. And a number of different organizations are um, active in this field. 
uh, not least, for instance, the various um, uh, suggestions uh, and assistance that's put in by things like the CCBE when they have argued um, relentlessly for defence safeguards in the European Public Prosecutor provisions. Obviously, it's not something the UK is involved with now or was ever going to be involved with. Um, but uh, they did argue strenuously and strongly for defence safeguards to be introduced in, in that. And we now have uh, the roadmap and, and a number of different defence provisions at European level, um, which didn't exist at the start and certainly didn't exist when the um, European Arrest Warrant Framework was brought in. Um, but the second interesting question is a, a much more local one. What would we do now post-Brexit in relation to uh, the case of PI? In other words, we have no recourse to Europe any longer, to the Luxembourg court. Um, it seems to me that our only answer would be either a domestic argument uh, relying on pre-existing case law uh, or to the extent that we continue to remain in parallel with it to European case law uh, as a persuasive force rather than a binding force, or separately, an application under Article 5, either here or in Strasbourg, um, in relation to um, unlawful imprisonment uh, awaiting extradition. Um, the trouble with Article 5 is that it's a different test, uh, as we all know, a very high test to satisfy. Uh, and the second problem with Strasbourg is the very, very substantial delay. Um, one of the notable things about the Luxembourg court is that in all the time it's been operating, where there is a PPU, there is a, a, a swift, urgent uh, process because somebody is in custody, they pride themselves on deciding the case within three months, as indeed they, did, they, they achieved in this case. Um, a decision within three months is unheard of in Strasbourg, uh, as also, to be fair, pretty rare in this country as well at the, at the high court level. Um, so if we are to go the Article 5 route, I think we face very substantial delays on behalf of defendants, and quite often people are actually returned before you get a final answer out of Strasbourg. I, I have still one application outstanding that I think I put into Strasbourg when I first started extradition law in sometime in the 90s, and it's died a death, and the people have long since returned uh, to the requesting state, and I don't know whatever happened to that case, but I never got an answer. I never even got a no. So um, delay is the other problem with that. So um, I'm afraid my summation of this position is that although PI was an interesting uh, case and has had a, a, an interesting outcome, um, as with so much of the dismal world in which we now seem to live uh, in post-Brexit, um, things are very much worse for defendants now than they were at 1059 uh, on the 31st of December 2020. Uh, I'm looking forward enormously to the moment where I can give a paper that is wholly upbeat and does not contain any kind of pessimistic misery uh, or have the word Brexit involved in it, but that time is not yet here. So that would be my quick run through of PI. Thank you, Thank you. Helen. Uh, Fergus, no. um, please I will you uh, now turn to um, the question of effective judicial protection as a, yeah. as a concept of EU and, and, and UK law and give us your view of how the concept might exist also um, as a, as a concept of common law. I shall. Um, thank you, Josh. Just picking up on Helen's uh, rather downbeat assessment, I would agree and I would point her to, although I'm sure she knows and just didn't refer to it because of time, to Schedule 1.3 subparagraph 2 of the 2018 Withdrawal Act as amended, and I stress that because it's been amended by the 2020 Act, very important that any practitioner reads the amendments, and that says in terms, no court or tribunal or other public authority may on or after IP completion day, that's implementation period completion day, which was 11 p.m. on the 31st, disapply or quash any enactment or other rule of law or quash any conduct or otherwise decide it is unlawful because it is incompatible 
with any of the general principles of EU law. So that's quite a carve out. Um, first of all, many first of all, thank you for inviting me. Secondly, many congratulations to Helen and Josh for winning their um, uh, uh, their case that uh, has been so expertly described by Helen. What she didn't say is that she not only faced well, they not only face the Bulgarian government, but they also face the European Commission, uh, who supported the Bulgarian government and therefore didn't support them. So, you know, jolly good for um, uh, sorting out uh, the position in the light of that. I want to deal in the short time I've got available with two discrete issues. One is the impact of Brexit in general, and, uh, the, and the second point is the position in relation to the UK's application to join Lugano, both in the context of effective judicial protection, insofar as that principle can be taken to include mutual trust and confidence. Um, in terms of the principle of effective judicial protection, as a matter of EU law, there are three strands to it. The first strand is access to a court, including extending legal aid to legal persons, which is based on Article 6 and 13 of the ECHR plus Article 47 of the EU Charter. Now, every time I, I mention the Charter, please remember that that is no longer applicable as a matter of UK law pursuant to the Brexit legislation. I'll come to that in a moment. The first, so the first strand access to court, second strand equal treatment. So that <clears throat> this essentially means that um, a national of a member state carrying out an economic activity in one in, in another member state, in a host member state, must be able to bring cases in that host member state on the same footing as its own nationals, which led to the well-known uh, case law about security for costs. Because back in the day, you could get security for costs in this jurisdiction against uh, a, a party that on the basis of its foreignness, if I can call it that, um, that went by the board in a case called Checkpoint, um, uh, which I uh, uh, was involved with on the losing uh, side. Now that's an issue that will only continue to apply within the EU and therefore that drops out of the domestic strands of uh, judicial, effective judicial protection going forward. The third strand is effective judicial review and this requires that the competent authority whose decision is before a member state court has to state its reasons for any national decision. Uh, which is contested on the basis of EU law. Now, one point of interest is, of course, the, Fol the Falk's recent review of judicial review in this country. And it might have been, uh, the government might have been constrained going forward. I think we know that they're not going to take on board everything that Falk's has said, or if they are, they're going to add quite substantially to it, thereby diminishing access to justice through judicial review. They might have been constrained in so doing had we been, uh, had we still been a member state uh, that uh, on the basis of inter alia effective judicial protection, that uh, may not be uh, the case. Now it's sometimes effective judicial protection has been described as an autonomous concept of EU law. I don't think I would necessarily agree with that description. As with many other areas of EU law involving general principles, uh, that or relating to effective judicial protection has been taken from a number of different sources and traditions in different member states, including the UK. And as we've seen in the PI case, has found its, has wormed its way into uh, the Charter of Fundamental uh, Rights. Um, but there are differences uh, between the EU's approach and that of the member states. And the position is, as I, I would respectfully suggest, a fortiori in the context of the UK and Brexit, particularly given, as I've already said, the Charter no longer ap applies. Um, so that is just a very brief overview of effective judicial protection. What I want to now do 
is look at the 2018 Withdrawal Act and its effect on effective judicial protection within, and I have to say, it, I keep on saying uh, either this jurisdiction or I say the UK. Now, the legislation is UK wide, but obviously this jurisdiction is the jurisdiction I'm familiar with and able to practice in, that of England and Wales, and therefore, please, those listening, do not take me to be talking specifically about uh, Scottish uh, law, because I'm not. Um, by way of uh, introduction, section five, subsection four and subsection five are rather critical to the discussion we're having of the 2018 Act as amended. Section 5.4 reads, the Charter of Fundamental Rights is not part of domestic law on or after exit day. Very straightforward. Section 5.5, subsection four does not affect the retention in domestic law on or after exit day in accordance with this Act of any fundamental rights or principles which exist irrespective of the Charter uh, and references to charter in any case law are so far as necessary for the purpose to be read as if there were references to any corresponding retained fundamental rights or principles. Now, so just pausing there, insofar as the EU principle of judicial protection arises through non-charter based case law, and it did in part in PI, um, handed down prior to the end of the transition period. Now, PI didn't, but there is case law, proceeding case law that was, that will remain relevant. So you carve out the charter case law and you keep the non-charter case law. In terms of how the UK courts will deal with this sort of situation going forward, section six assists. Section six one, a court or tribunal is not bound by any principles laid down or any decisions made on or after IP completion day by the European court and can't refer any matter to the court. 6.2, subject to this and subsection 3 to 6, a court or tribunal may have regard to anything done on or after completion day by the European court, another European entity, brackets, which means essentially the European Commission, or the EU, so far as is relevant. So pausing there, the effect of those provisions is that insofar as domestic UK law courts are bound by the principle of EU law relating to effective judicial protection, which we've just looked at, that principle will be fixed as at the end of the transition period. It'll be ASPIC bound. However, insofar as the European Court moves on, expands or otherwise changes that principle thereafter, the domestic courts in this country may have regard to any such developments. Um, and finally, Schedule 1, really critical as I've uh, uh, um, referred to already, Schedule 1.1 1 .1 Subparagraph one, there is no right in domestic law on or after IP completion day to challenge any retained EU law on the basis that immediately prior to IP completion day, an EU instrument was invalid. So you can't uh, seek to do what was done a lot before leading to inter alia Frankovich damages, which have also been banned or prohibited. Um, one, two, no general principle of EU law is part of domestic law on or after IP completion day if it wasn't recognised as a general principle of EU law by the European Court. Well, that doesn't apply in this instance because the principle of uh, judicial protection was. And one, three, one, there's no right of action in domestic law on or after IP completion day based on any failure to comply with any principles of EU law rather important, and I've already read 1.3 subparagraph 2, which is a critical point, disapplying or quashing any enactment or quashing any conduct because it's incompatible with the gen any general principles of EU law, not restricted to the Charter, any. So that's out the window as well. Um, so I would suggest that had 1.3 subparagraph 2 been applicable to Helen and Josh's case, uh, that would have been problematic. Now, very quickly, 
Um, in terms of the TCA, the 2020 Trade and Cooperation Agreement, which was signed on Christmas Eve, um, there's the term effective judicial protection doesn't appear in the 1,246 pages of the TCA and its accompanying annexes. Essentially, it is unlike <clears throat> the TFEU, the TEU, any treaty, uh, any EU treaty that has, um, has, has, has been ad ad adopted. Uh, essentially, the rule in Van Genter Lost, which uh, was uh, taken in the early days, uh, which gave rise to the principle of direct effect, whereby individuals had rights both against other individuals and against states, so vertical and horizontal, that is not part of this agreement. It is a pure international uh, agreement, trade agreement, party shall speak unto party, and you know, individuals uh, don't find a place therein, save in respect of two exceptions. One is in relation to social security, which we're not going to I'm not going to drone on about, but the second one is important, and that's under the uh, snappily entitled article law.gen.1.1. The objective of this part, this is part three, is to provide for law enforcement and judicial cooperation between member states uh, and the UK uh, in relation to the prevention, investigation, detection and prosecution of criminal offences and the prevention of and fight against money laundering. Now, why is that important uh, in this context? Because article law.gen.1.2 says this part, so that's part three, only applies to law enforcement and judicial cooperation taking place exclusively between the United Kingdom and uh, the Union and member states on the other hand. And uh, essentially, uh, it states in terms that um, there is the possibility for individuals to rely on rights uh, that arise uh, in uh, the context of that part. So there are directly effective rights uh, that arise in the context of uh, the law.gen part three, i.e. law enforcement and judicial cooperation in criminal uh, matters. Brilliant. So that's good. But the rest of it, in terms of civil, ordinary civil litigation, there's nothing. Uh, essentially, individuals don't have any rights there under. I'm going to finish now very briefly with Lugano. Now, Lugano, as you will be aware, is the uh, reflects the Brussels regulation uncast. Brussels regulation recast is what applies now between the member states and which was applicable uh, in the United Kingdom until we left. Um, that dealt with the recognition and enforcement of judgments in civil matters. Now, Lugano uh, is essentially uh, a lesser arrangement involving the EFTA uh, member states and Denmark, um, because Denmark didn't sign up to the recast. And it uh, provides for mutual trust and mutual recognition, um, but in between uh, the contracting states, but in a slightly lesser way than one had under Brussels recast, in particular, in relation to uh, Liz Pendens and what was well known as the Italian torpedo. You'll recall that that uh, relates to situations where there is an exclusive uh, jurisdiction clause in an agreement and the party, one of the parties there too, breaches that and decides to issue proceedings deliberately in another member state, often Italy because of its length of its uh, 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 procedure, so as to delay matters. Now, Brussels recast changed that um, but Brussels unrecast hasn't, and therefore were the UK to be able to sign up to Lugano, and we applied last year to do so, then that would be fine, and we would bring in, this comes back to the mutual trust that Helen was discussing, albeit not quite on the same basis as, as Brussels recast. Um, however, the possibility of us uh, actually 
acceding to Lugano, qua third country, has been put in uh, some doubt because although on Monday morning the FT reported that the Commission were in favour of this, by uh, yesterday evening uh, they uh, reported uh, that the Commission had come out strongly, uh, backed by France, uh, against our application. So uh, where does that leave us? That leaves us in a situation where th there is a possibility, I'm not calling it a probability, there's a possibility that we may have to fall back on our ordinary common law rules that apply to the recognition uh, and enforcement of judgments with third countries, which don't necessarily comprise any or any meaningful um, basis on which a court can determine that matter based on mutual trust and confidence. That's a very EU autonomous concept. And therefore it may well be that in the future, uh, we uh, will be in a situation where we spend a lot of time in the commercial court in interim hearings, debating the, these issues through, at interim hearings, but not based on mutual trust and confidence, which will have the effect of one, delaying matters, and two, increasing the cost, which in turn could well impinge on the wish of this jurisdiction to remain a jurisdiction of choice. That's it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, uh, Fergus. Um, more optimism there, kind of. Rachel, um, could you please um, introduce the concept of effective judicial protection in relation to European Union sanctions law and um, tell us how the concept might also evolve in your field of expertise post-Brexit. Yeah, I'd be delighted to, Joshua. Firstly, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and to listen both to Helen and to Fergus. Um, so I'm going to start off by talking about effective ju judicial protection and EU sanctions law, then look a little bit up at what it will be like for us now post Brexit in the UK under the brave new world of UK autonomous sanctions regimes under SAMLA, which is the Sanctions and Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2018. Uh, and then I want to focus in that on the question of whether or not there might be mutual recognition of sanctions listings uh, by other jurisdictions in their autonomous or unilateral sanctions regimes. And I'm going to focus when I do so on um, anti-corruption sanctions measures. These are a, um, a new, relatively new form of sanctions. We hear them in respect to the states and the uh, US Magnitsky Act sanctions that are seen to uh, be introduced in the UK. So with that, starting off, effective judicial protection EU sanctions. Uh, again, I'm, I want to focus on those cases where the EU sanctions designations have been based on decisions by competent authorities in third states or otherwise outside the EU. So three types of EU sanctions cases. Firstly, those sanctions where the UN Security Council established the sanctions regime and issued a list of people, targ uh, sorry, a targeted list of people who should be subject to those sanctions and then that was transposed into EU law, uh, and that's focusing on the Cardi cases. Then secondly, uh, counter-terrorism sanctions, um, autonomous EU sanctions regimes, uh, and the case of the L Council and LTTE, that's the Tamil Tigers case, which really did develop this idea of effective judicial protection when the designation, the listing decision is based on a decision by a, th a third state. And then lastly, the more recent cases under the Ukraine and Egyptian misappropriation sanctions regimes of uh, Azarov and Thabet. And these are sanctions regimes established by the EU following um, firstly the uh, 2014 regime change in the Ukraine 
and then secondly after the Arab Spring in relation to Egypt, where old regime goes out, new regime comes in, says that the old regime members have been um, responsible for the misappropriation of assets, and the EU established a regime whereby people who are identified as responsible for the misappropriation of state assets themselves can be targeted by sanctions. So with that, um, going back to Cardi, then this is the first Cardi case, 2008, where the uh, Mr. Cardi was subject to Al-Qaeda sanctions issued by the UN Security Council. These were uh, transposed into EU law. And uh, the e Council's position was that effectively Mr. Cardi had no judicial review rights within European uh, law and before the European courts, because this was a decision by the UN Security Council and all member states of the EU were obliged to implement those mandatory decisions of the EU Security Council under Chapter 7 of the EU, uh, sorry, of the UN Charter. Um, the EU court in a very seminal decision, the Court of Justice said, no, that's not right. Where even though this is a UN Security Council measure that's being effectively transposed into EU law, it is essentially an EU action EU legal regime is an autonomous legal regime for the, which includes the protection of rights. And th so here we see the concept of effective judicial protection having some teeth in what was a really difficult decision of um, international collective security mechanisms under the UN Security Council, as opposed to the autonomous legal regime of the EU. Um, then fast forward to 2013, Mr. Cardi is back before the um, EU courts and the Court of Justice because uh, he says he still has not had the opportunity to challenge his listing and his designation. And the Court, court of Justice, the EU court said yes again that there wasn't an um, effective mechanism for him to challenge his designation before the UN Security Council, that it wasn't good enough for the Council in uh, the EU Council simply to say well these are the reasons that the UN Security Council say you're designated, but in fact to ensure that Mr Cardi had effective judicial protection, the EU courts had to be in a position to assess the information or evidence and the probative value of that information or evidence that was relied upon to make out the facts um, that were alleged against him that justified or were said to justify his listing by the UN Security Council under the Al-Qaeda sanctions regime. So again, this was a really quite a this is a big decision so far as um, the different regimes of international security under the UN Security Council and the uh, the EU regimes are concerned because it gives teeth to the EU um, concept of effective judicial protection. So that was Cardi, that's 2013. We then move forward to the LTTE case again here we have uh, EU autonomous counterterrorism sanctions measures, but where the this case the Tamil Tigers have been listed as prescribed organisations both by the UK and also by India, and um, the EU Council had listed them under the EU sanctions regime, counterterrorism sanctions regime, and. Uh, again, relying upon the decision of the UK competent authorities, but the EU court said if the EU Council, the EU institutions are going to rely upon the decision of a um, third state, they have to verify that, that, that the uh, designated person has had the opportunity to have effective judicial protection and to challenge that listing in order to ensure 
the, the fundamental rights of the right to the defense and the right to effective judicial protection is adhered to under the EU regime. Then to fast forward again to the misappropriation sanctions measures that I mentioned, the uh, Azarov and Thabet cases under the Ukrainian and the Egyptian misappropriation sanctions regimes. Um, in 2017, the EU Court of Justice, the CJEU, uh, decided that the listing of Azarov, who had been the Prime Minister of the Ukraine, that, that he the court annulled that decision to maintain his listing on the basis that although he had been identified by the Ukrainian authorities as a person who had misappropriated state assets, and that was the criterion for listing under the EU sanctions regime, the council had not independently verified that the Ukrainian authorities when I so identifying him, when introducing their um, judicial decisions in respect of uh, Azarov, that they had enabled him to have his fundamental rights protected, his rights to the def of defence, his rights to effective judicial protection, and so the his listing was annulled. Now, that came back to the EU courts um, three times most recently in December of this year, and along with the Fabet case, where similarly the EU had applied sanctions measures, so asset freezing, etc., measures, against um, Mubarak, the former pre uh, president of Egypt, and his family and uh, associates, on the basis that they had misappropriated state assets in Egypt. And again, the um, CJEU held that if the European Union institutions are going to rely upon decisions by a third state when making these list sanctions listings, they have to independently verify that the individuals, the designated person, the listed person's rights have been protected in the judicial proceedings in that third state. So um, that is a short canter through the concept of effective judicial protection in sanctions, EU sanctions cases, where the sanctions designation is based in turn upon a decision by a third state or the UN Security Council. What does that mean for us uh, now post Brexit? and the sanctions regimes in, uh, in the UK are autonomous sanctions regime under SAMLA, the Sanctions Anti-Money Laundering Act. Well, as you probably know, firstly, under SAMLA, um, during the transition period, the, the idea was that the EU sanctions regimes, the content of them was effectively transposed uh, into English or uh, UK laws. Um, although now, so it's effectively migrated, but now we have autonomous sanctions regimes have been established, the global human rights sanctions regime, and soon to be um, launched the UK's global anti-corruption sanctions regime, the UK Magnitsky sanctions. Um, both of these sanctions regimes, uh, I mean, persons, individuals, companies, etc., can be listed where the minister decides there is reasonable grounds to suspect that they are in, the person is involved in the targeted conduct, be it the abuse of human rights um, overseas, or be it uh, serious corruption of or by foreign public officials, and that the sanctions are, it is appropriate to impose sanctions upon them. Um, for the reasons that um, Fergus has said, I don't think that the, uh, we are going to see a um, the the courts if if and when they come to decide um, or litigation on uh, these designations 
they, I don't think we will see a wholesale introduction of the idea of effective judicial protection as it's known under EU law. But what instead we will see is um, a de decision making or rather the um, assessment of whether the decision making that somebody is, there are reasonable grounds to suspect they are involved in the targeted conduct where part of those grounds rely on the fact that there have been proceedings in other jurisdictions, there will be an assessment as to whether or not there's been any evaluation of those proceedings in the other jurisdictions, whether or not the designated or potentially designated person has the right to challenge the proceedings in those other states. So whilst it may be uh, not in the same formal sense, I think substantively there will be similarities. The what I think will be uh, also important to consider is that these will be judicial review standards, so it won't be the court making its own assessment, but rather applying judicial review standards to the decisions taken by the minister. And then lastly, there will be a consideration as far as um, the appropriateness of the imposition of sanctions. Uh, there will be a careful, I think, scrutiny of whether it was proportionate as regards the um, interference with convention rights to impose sanctions and whether the minister made a reasonable and lawful decision in determining that the imposition of sanctions did involve a proportionate interference with the rights, be it rights to property, rights um, to um, family life, or um, which I suspect will be the rights most um, commonly relied upon. So Joshua, that is a counter um, through the last 25 years to where Thank we you. are today and where we may be tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I am just keeping my eye on the on the Q&A uh, and it's and it's pretty empty at the moment. But I'm, I'm just going to um, ask everybody if you have any questions, please either raise your hands or um, unmute your mic and or switch on your video. Um, and, and please do um, either ask your question or, or type it in the Q&A. But, but whilst that is um, going on, I, if I may ask a, a question of my own to, to each of you, um, and, and it arises from, from ev everyone's remarks, I, I think, which, and, and in particular, um, Fergus's um, remarks and, and incredibly helpful references to the 2018 Act. Um, my question is, is in, in your view, is, is the effective judicial protection a, a general principle of uh, European Union law, or um, could one view uh, the concept as um, a substantive right in and of itself um, that one may ground in, in Article 13 of the Convention, for example, or Article 47 of the Charter? as um as the, the the court did in in the pi case um what are your views on that and, and and fergus in particular um how would that impact upon your analysis of uh schedule one paragraph three two of the 2018 2018 act well um uh, thank you josh i think the problem we have is as i tried to make clear you've got to identify non-charter rights now going forward because the charter is no more the charter is dead and gone and it can't be brought back at least under the present legislation it's very clear the charter no longer applies going forward so any if you want to found a claim in whole or in part on uh, an argument that uh, effective judicial protection has not been afforded to your client, you will have to do it through some other means. Now, those are, there are two means. First of all, you can go through the ECHR. Luckily, we haven't left that. Uh, we haven't left the convention. And so that's useful. One can rely on that. And also you can rely on domestic, purely domestic common law principles. And they exist. There is no doubt about that. The question is whether they are as extensive as they are under the EU 
principle of effective judicial um, <clears throat> protection, and I would submit that probably they're not, and probably in the near future they're going to get less and less um, uh, similar, and therefore they'll drift apart, and therefore any any reliance would need any any uh, sufficient reliance would need to be predicated. I would suggest strongly on relevant articles in the ECHR, but then you fall into the problem that Helen identified, which is delay. And you're stuck with that and it's just getting worse. And so unfortunately, I feel as a matter of actual reality, actual rights on the ground, that because of Brexit, we are left in a situation under the 2018 Act as amended, whereby the ability to challenge is less pursuant to Schedule 1.3.1, I mean, totally less. Uh, and insofar as one wants to rely in any event on general principles that were otherwise available to one, including the effective judicial, the pr principle of effective judicial protection, that has been not eviscerated, but it's been reduced. And one has now, one can no longer rely as you did on Article 47 of the Charter, that's a non-runner. So there are possibilities, but they're less attractive. Thank you. And Helen, uh, if we were litigating PI now, could, could we have grounded our case in Article 13 of the Convention? Well, uh, um, Article 13 and Article 5 together, I think. Um, but for the reasons I've already said, I, I don't think it would have been effective. Uh, and, and the Strasbourg Court has been very reluctant in any event, it seems to me, to enforce what some of us think are the full extent of the rights under the European Convention. And the UK courts are even more reluctant to enforce even that which is set out by Strasbourg. Uh, so I would be fairly pessimistic about it all. And Ra Rachel, in, 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 the, in the field of sanctions, uh, law. I mean, to, to what extent um, can one decouple the the right to effect, the principle of effective judicial protection from from rights to a remedy? Well, I think you will find it there to decoupling for all the reasons that Fergus and um, Helen have touched upon when we're looking at the uh, designations under the UK's autonomous uh, sanctions regimes, and it will be certainly the so far as mutual recognition, if you like, or relying on the fact that sanctions designations have been introduced by um, international partners, the, the question that will be, need to be asked is, um, do those sanctions designations by um, international partners mean that there are reasonable grounds to suspect that the individual has indeed been involved in glo global human rights uh, abuses or whatever the targeted conduct is? Yep. But I do think it will be more reduced. Uh, under SAMLA, the, uh, it is limited to uh, the standards of judicial review. Yeah. Um, Josh, I'm going to have to drop off, unfortunately, um, if, if, if that's all right. If, 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 if there are any questions um, that other people want to ask, um, I'm very happy to answer them on, offline uh, by email or, or, or whatever. <laughs> Um, whatever route is taken. Thank so, you, folks, and thank you so much for, for great, participating. Great pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 We've, we've, got, we've got about five minutes um, of our allocated time to go. So um, notwithstanding um, Fergus's departure, we'll, we'll, we'll if you don't mind, Rachel and Helen, I, I, I'm going to take up five minutes more of your time. Sure. Um, so, Rachel, just just to just to pick up uh, there, um, under the new uh, UK legislative framework of of, of the SAMLA, and taking into account um, the points that um, Fergus was making with respect to uh, the continuing persuasiveness of CJEU uh, jurisprudence going forward, yet the disapplication of general principles of EU law, 
to what extent do you think uh, we can see uh, a divert? We will see a divergence from the principles established by the CJEU sanctions jurisprudence um, with respect to the to the protection of individual rights, or is it simply inevitable as a result of the change in legislation? A bit of both, I think. Um, certainly by uh, the most recent decisions, the December decisions by the uh, CJEU, so far as uh, sanctions designations that are based on decisions of third states, these uh, and the, what effective judicial protection means. I think these were quite robust because the court uh, has been saying that the EU Council, if it's going to make a sanctions designation based upon the decision of a, uh, in, of a judicial authority in a third state, it has to satisfy itself and independently verify that the individual's rights of uh, the defence and judicial protection were respected in that third state. And the court, the CJEU went as far as to say it was not good enough to say, well, that third state in the case of Ukraine is a member of the um, uh, Council of Europe. And so the ECHR applies to it or um, or in the case of Egypt to say, well, actually, Mubarak never managed to provide any independent, objective and reliable evidence to say that his rights had been um, uh, somehow curtailed. And so. Um, the council had no independent verification obligations. No, the courts, the CJEU said, no, the, the council has got, the burden is upon it to make those uh, inquiries and to verify and satisfy itself it can rely on those decisions. Um, and which I think is quite robust. I think we will see um, a, a divergence ultimately in the UK. I don't think that certainly at the beginning we will see um, the courts really willing to go that far, particularly when they are applying concept or a judicial review standard rather than making their own determinations of whether or not there are reasonable grounds to suspect it, an individual is involved in targeted conduct. So um, I, for that reason, I, I have some pessimism. If I can come in sort of generally just in the last couple of minutes, more broadly, I don't see the courts of this country diverging greatly from CJEU jurisdiction uh, case law, unless they have to, unless they're forced that way by statute. Um, first, because I think that they're naturally conservative and they are more inclined to follow something that was so recently binding. Um, and secondly, because it seems to me that the, the judges in the High Court are acutely aware of the problems to which that is likely to lead commercially as much as legally. Um, so my instinct is that they will remain as long as they can in parallel to the existing decisions. Um, obviously, as I say, if they're forced away from that path by legislation, then that's a different matter. Um, but there is also a sense, I think, a very real sense that the UK has modelled and, and moulded uh, the development of human rights law and to an extent of some of the judicial protection uh, laws and certainly the defence safeguards that with PACE we long, long predated the criminal safeguards for uh, people who are arrested. I mean, just the simple ideas of being told what you've been arrested for in a language you understand and told the rights that you have uh, in terms of a lawyer or contesting it. Those three simple rights have taken the member states of the European Union a very long time to agree upon. And we've had them since at least 1985 um, and very likely uh, 1986 and very likely, oh, when was Pace? Four, 1984 uh, and very, very likely a lot longer than that too. And so, diverging from CJEU is not going to be very attractive because we would say, well, we were there before them in the first place. Um, so that's, that's some very small note of optimism uh, perhaps to end on. That, thank you, Helen, and, and thank, you, thank you both um, so much for uh, agreeing um, to participate in this. I, I found um, 
all of the contributions um, fascinating, the comparative juxtaposition of the civil law with the sanctions law, with the criminal law, uh, particularly illuminating um, myself and the unpacking of um, concepts relating to human rights, general yeah. principles of law, and how uh, mutual trust and, and, and recognition interrelate with this overarching idea of, of effective judicial protection. Um, I've, I've learned a, a lot myself. Um, thank you to, to um, the clerks at um, Brick Court and uh, Three Raymond Buildings and um, to Julian and Mark from Nine Bedford Row for hosting us on this Zoom um, conference. Um, that's all uh, we have time for today, but um, looking forward to, to seeing you hopefully in a pub garden very, very soon. Josh, can I say one one very final thing just before we leave the case of PI, because I think it is right to say, and I notice that Robert Katz is, is online here, that the point that you and I took was a point that Robert Katz and Ben Seifert, and ben, Seifert ha yeah. ben Seifert, sorry, ha had already uh, considered, and indeed it was their point, but uh, right. because our case was at the chap in custody, it leapfrogged over them, That's but it's right. right to acknowledge that this was very largely to do with the work that they put in uh, before uh, Mr. P.I. came in, so to speak, Absolute, at all. Absolutely right to say, and um, it's great to see Rob here, and I hope you've found it um, as interesting as we have, Rob. Thanks very much. Thanks for organising it, Josh. Thank you. Take care. Bye.